we go. Um, February 27, 2023. And for those that are just arriving now, we are going to have, uh, we will have a quiz today between 11.30 and 12 noon. You should see that poster there in Canvas. Make sure you can see it. And please let me know if you uh, let me know if you can see it, by the way. And here you go. The quest is not available until February 27, 11.35 a.m., right? It's due 11.59 a.m., which is one minute before 12 noon. Three questions only. And Okay, so make sure you can see it. Here you go, my student view, you should see something like that. Okay. I'm playing another quiz next week, March 6th, same time. First exam is Wednesday of next week. There will be no lab. Expect chapters 18, 19, and possibly 20, whatever we manage to cover until the day after tomorrow. Oh, what else do we have? Wednesday, the day after uh, next lab, uh, the day after tomorrow, the day after tomorrow is electric field two. Okay. First lab uh, report is due before this, before next lab, before the start of next lab. And what we're going to do today? Okay, example, I wanna cover a little bit of example of electric field lines of different charge distributions, examples of equipotential surfaces or curves of different charge distributions as well. Then I'm gonna get into capacitors and dielectrics. And we will start electric uh, circuit. Okay. So here you go. The easiest, the easiest electric field lines are for the Infinitely large play, infinitely charged, infinitely charged plate and the point charge. Everything else is more difficult. Everything else is more difficult to visualize. Okay. But that's the, the that, those are the two that you must have by heart. Okay. Okay. For the case of infinitely large, infinitely infinitely charged plate was the lab that we did last week, which is, by the way, is an approximation to infinitely charged plate. Electric field is uniform or constant, uniform or constant. Uniform and constant, let's put it this way. Uniform and constant, okay? What means uniform? Uniform, uh, you better know that, right? This definition is does not vary in space, okay? What's the meaning of constant? Does not vary in time, time and space, space and time, right? So that's what you have to know. One does not vary in space, it's constant in space. Right? Is constant in space. It's better if we do that. Uh, yeah, that's not very easy. Let's not put constant. Constant is usually used for, for something that doesn't change in time. Okay? That's not change in time. Even better, that's not change, right? That's not change in space. That's not change in time. That's, that's easy enough to remember, right? So, if you have uh, if you have a single charged plate, okay, the electric field, you know, hopefully you remember that, right? Is going to be 
a single charge at play. The electric field is going to be sigma over epsilon epsilon naught. A single charge oh, over two epsilon naught. A single charge at play. Okay. If you have two charged plates, one positive and the other negative, if you have two charged plates, one positive, positively charged, one positive, and the other negative, and we did that in the classroom, okay? The electric field is twice as much as the other. And remember, what's the sigma? Sigma is what? The electric charge divided by the area, right? Electric charge divided by the area. I'm going to copy that here and paste right here. Electric charge of the plate divided by the area. Here's the same thing. Surface charge density. And those electric fields are easier to, to, to visualize because they are uniform. How do they look like? I have some illustrations here for you. Uh, here you go. Here is the electric field, is the uniform electric field, the electric field between two plates. Electric field lines between two plates. The lines start on the positive and ends on the negative. Okay? Outside those plates, the electric field is zero, which was exactly what we did for that lab. We, you, when we perform that uh, experiment, you know, when we really do the experiment in real life, we do measure. We do find out that the electric potential changes linearly here in between those two plates, but the electric potential is constant here outside. You know, if this one is zero here, this, this region is gonna be zero here. If this one is 10 volts, this region here is gonna be 10 volts all over. Constant electric potential means zero electric field. Constant electric potential means zero electric field. So that's the one of the easiest electric field distributions. The other one that's the easiest is this one right here. The point charge can be either positive or negative. The electric field just radiates away from the electric charge. And I'm going to write that down here. Uh -huh. If you have two charged plates, two charged plates. If you have, if you have a point charge, come on, either positive or negative, either positive or negative, the electric field is. I wrote that down before, right? There you go. It's like that. And it looks, the direction is just a radio, in the radial direction. Okay. And that's what this one we have here. I want you to memorize only those two. Okay. And why is that? Because everything else is very complicated. I'm gonna give you an example. The case of a dipole. Look a lot. Look like. Look what a electric dipole. The electric field of the electric dipole looks like. Okay. We, you know, the expression for those electric fields is very complicated. Okay. But uh, keep in mind that what you have to know, okay, is that the electric field always starts at the positive and ends at the negative. In this case here, you don't have an electric dipole. You have two poles of the same electric with the same electric charge, same sign, right? And the electric field again is start on the positive. It starts on the positive. Since we do not have a negative here, all those electric field lines they go away into infinity. And what you see here again is very difficult to visualize. With even if you have the equations, it's very difficult to plot. You need some heavy. You need some special programs to plot something like that. Don't try to do something like that by hand. It's too much work, okay? Don't try to do something like that. Here, and here are the other, other examples of electric field lines, okay? Here is the case of the electric field line of, uh, 
of a sharp concentration of charges, okay, that we use this type of thing to attract the lightning so you can protect the buildings, okay? And here is the other case of a positive charge next to, to, a, to a plate that's negatively charged. Okay, so though these are the two most important electric fields that you must have, must know by heart my heart all the other uh let's see all the other electric fields can be derived mathematically they can be derived mathematically okay the only problem is how you're going to visualize them but they are very hard to visualize in terms of electric field lines, electric field lines, okay? And then what else? That's the electric field. And what about, what about the electric potential? What about the electric potential, right? Okay, for the parallel plate, parallel charge, uh, parallel plate, right? The electric potential varies linearly with the E field. So it's gonna be, I wrote that down as well. I am going to like, like, like uh, let's see, well, this one here. The V is equal to E X, where X is the distance from the, from, oh, by the way, it's a negative here, right? Is the distance from the negative plate. And for the point charge, for the point charge, the electric potential varies with the inverse of the distance, varies with the inverse of the distance. Okay, it's not difficult to memorize because it's very similar uh, to what we have here for the electric field. Okay, the only difference is that you don't have R squared there. You have R. It's the inverse of the distance. Here is the inverse of the square of the distance. Here is the inverse of the distance. You have to memorize that, those, okay? That is a relation on, okay. And, and then we have the equipotential lines. We also have the equipotential lines. Okay, what means equipotential lines? Lines of same potential. That's what it means. Lines of same electric potential. Electric potential. Everybody can see my screen, right? Just, just uh, you know, just make sure that uh, yeah. I'm sharing the right screen here. Yes? Yes. Okay, good, thank you. Here you go. Okay. And then that figure that you saw also show the equipotentials. Okay, here you go. The equipotentials are those dashed lines that you see here, okay? In our experiment, the zero potential was exactly at the negative plate, at the negative electrode, and kept on increasing in value, okay? Kept on increasing in value. until 10 volts. Here we have the same thing. Okay, let me see how, let's see how many we have. Um, dois, tres, cinco, seis. Yeah, okay. Yeah, they have like 10 equipotential lines there. 
Don't forget, this illustration here is actually a three, supposed to be a three-dimensional figure, right? In a three-dimensional space, you're gonna have those two plates and you know uh, equipotential surfaces in between them. In the case for a point charge, we have something similar. The equipotential surfaces are spheres, right? Centered about the point charge. And the values of those equipotential decreases as you move further and further away because it goes with the inverse of the distance. It goes with the inverse of the distance, okay? Now, again, look how complicated that the equipotential lines are for a dipole, okay? Again, it's very difficult to derive that mathematically by hand. This one by hand is easy because it has symmetry. This one by hand is easy too because it's, it has symmetry. But those one here, this one here, this one here, you know, they look just like that. There's not, they're not uh, straightforward. Okay, here we have uh, a region of equipotential, which is by the way, is going to be zero, okay? This line that you see, this surface that you see right in here, the equipotential surface that you see here, you will have a value equal to zero because it's going to be the contribution of the potential of this positive charge plus the contribution of the potential of this negative charge. The distance is the same, right? The charge, the magnitude of the charge are the same. It's only the sign that's different. At this point, the distance from the negative to this point and the distance of the positive to this point is gonna be the same. So they cancel out, okay? But at this point right in here, the distance from the negative charge is shorter than the distance from the positive charge. So I can tell you right away that the surface here is going to be negative. Electric potential is gonna be negative. I don't know what's gonna be the exact value, but I know qualitatively that the value here is negative. The value here is negative. The value here is negative because the negative charge is closer. Similarly, here is going to be positive, 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 because the positive charge is closer. Okay, and, and here again, you can see the surfaces are very complicated to draw, rather complicated to draw, okay? That's what uh, you have to know about the electric field lines, uh, examples of electric field lines of different charge distributions. Let's take a look at the book. Uh, the book is right in here. Electric, electric uh, forces, electric potential energy, and uh, electric field. Let's see if we have some electric field lines. Here you go, on the book. That's the point charge, electric field lines. Electric field lines are negative charge. And here, here you go, what we did, what we did in the classroom, what we did in the lab. The two plates, the two parallel plates, the electric fields are uniform here. Oh, it's, you have only a small variation of the electric field at the edges. We call it the edge effect of the electric field. But in this bulk region, the electric field is uniform, is indeed uniform. Okay, here you go. Dipole, look how complicated those electric fields are. Electric field lines are, right? When I was an undergraduate student, I was trying to derive those things mathematically by hand. You know, I, I just frustrated myself, you know, because it's just so difficult to, to figure out uh, all those electric field lines in a mathematical sense. What you have to do, you have to plot the electric field vectors first, like they have it here. And then you figure out and then you fill the blanks, you fill in the blanks between the positive charge and the negative charge. That's how you find out the electric field lines. First, you plot a bunch of electric field lines here between those two charges. Plot electric field uh, vectors, right? Electric field vectors between those two charges. That's how you initially do it. And once you have a, a picture of how the electric field vectors look like, then you can come up and fill the blanks and get the electric field lines. Along those lines, the electric field is tangential, okay? See this point here is tangent to this line. Here, the same thing, and so on. Oh, and then you can get more and more complicated, right? Here you go. 
for q minus two q minus q minus q. Okay, so we have a, that how complicated it can get. Okay. Electric field lines, by the way, they cannot cross each other. Okay, they cannot cross each other. Basically, he's asking, you know, show four choices, you know, all for the electric field lines between three negative point charges and one positive uh, point charge. Which of these choices is the only one of the four that could possibly show a correct representation of the field lines? Okay, this one cannot be because the electric field lines, this electric field line is crossing here. At point P, electric field lines don't cross each other. This part here is okay. Okay. This one cannot be because this is assuming that the electric field line between those two charges is uniform. So we, you know, we can uh, we can, you know, take this one out of the here. Okay, this one here. Looks right because it start uh, the lines start at the positive end of the negative, start at the positive end of the negative, start at the positive end of the negative, right? Start at the positive end of the negative. That's good. This one too, start at the positive end of the negative. The only difference here being is that the electric field here, you have uh, two lines here and only one line here. Okay. So the best representation is going to be which one? Is going to be the C, okay? Because of the number of lines that have, they put only, you know, one line here. They put only one line here whenever you're supposed to have a two, okay? The number of two lines that leave a positive charge or end on a negative charge. Okay, the, why, what, what uh, important application for electric field for electrophoresis of DNA, okay? So you might want to take a look at that. Okay, so here you go, we have an electrode, negatively charged electrode, positively charged electrode, and the, the DNA moves towards the positive electrode, okay? And what would be the electric potential? Let's see, electric potential surfaces, okay? Electric potential, here for, for the point charge. The electric potential surface of a point charge is those spheres that you see, imaginary spheres, right? That we see around the, the charge. We're going to have something in the lab uh, next uh, Wednesday. You're going to get some surfaces just like that. Okay, that's for a point charge. Electric field pointing away. Right, here you go. You have seen the quick potential lines in the other in the other drawing as well. Okay. So those are the examples. Here you go, the quick potential surface again between the two plates in that drawing that you saw. You saw a, a two-dimensional drawing. Here is more like a three-dimensional drawing. Electric field lines pointing from, from positive to negative. Okay, so keep that in mind. We go and so that's what I want to cover right now for you. Lecture notes, not this one. Yeah, examples of if you lines of different charge distributions, example of equipotential surface of different charge distributions. And now we're going to talk about capacitors, capacitors and dielectrics. Let's talk about capacitors and dielectrics. Equipotential. Okay, capacitor and dielectrics. Definition of capacitor. Definition of capacitor. What's a, what's a capacitor? Capacitor. Capacitor is a, a capacitor. Is two 
conducting surfaces. Conducting is two conductors that do not touch each other. Do not touch each other. Okay. In the most generic sense, let me get you a drawing. Okay, here you go. In the most generic sense, that's how a, capa a generic capacitor looks like. You know, you get a, a piece of metal. We get a, two pieces of metal, put it close to each other, charge one with a positive charge, ch charge the other with a negative charge. Okay. How do we do that? Okay. You can connect the battery to them. You start with those pieces, two pieces of metal, two pieces of conductors. Not necessarily metals, it's like uh, more general, more two pieces of conductors, two pieces of metal, conducting material, conduct, conductors. Okay. And then you put, how, how do you charge them? You can just connect them to a battery. Get a battery, can be the battery of your car, can be those small batteries, 1.5 volts, can be the nine volt battery. You connect this metal to the polarity, to the positive polarity of your battery and connect this metal to the other, to the negative polarity of your battery. Once you connect them, you can disconnect it and they are going to remain charged. They're going to remain charged because the material separating those two conductors is going to be a dielectric material, a non-conducting material. Air, for instance, is a non-conducting material. Okay? That's what a capacitor is. And they are very useful. They're very useful. They're the first important electric device that you must know. Okay? And I'm going to... Write that down for you. One positively charged, one positively charged, and the other negatively charged. How can you charge them? How can you charge them? Huh? You can charge them using a battery. I think I find a battery here of mine here nearby. Uh, I'm gonna have here my, my remote has a battery. I'm gonna open here where I show my battery. Triple way, I have a triple way battery here inside. All right? This is a source of energy. We, I carry energy in this small cell that you see right here. And it's not difficult to build a battery, by the way. Some people claim that the first battery was built like uh, 2,000 years ago. Some people claim. But uh, two, 3,000 years ago, like the Baghdad battery that they call it. But some historians that are really serious, they don't believe that, uh, that they did that at that time. Okay. So positive here at the, oh, let me see. Let me start, stop sharing, right? So you can see the battery in the larger, okay. Uh, I'm gonna I'm blur my background. Okay, here you go. My battery, okay. That's one example. Positive here at the tip, negative here at the bottom. What does it mean? It means that we have accumulation of positive electric charges here at the top. Accumulation of negative negative charges here at the bottom, and it, like I said, it's very easy to manufacture a battery. You can do that with a lemon. You can do that with salt water. You can do that with an apple. You can do that with an orange. Okay, all you have to do are those fruit to have those fruits, and get two different metals, two different metal pins. It cannot be the same metals. One should be zinc, the other copper, for instance. Okay. In principle, batteries could have been invented in antiquity, in principle, yes. But then suppose uh, the ancients were able to invent the battery. What is it, was he going to do with the battery? He didn't have any electrical devices, right? But in principle, yeah, battery could have been invented long time ago. That's why people claim that uh, that device that was discovered in Iraq, 
is a battery, a Baghdad battery. But there is no, like I said, like I said, no historians with serious. He believes that the device that they discovered was indeed a battery. Was they, they, they think it was something else? Okay, if you wanna, if you want to read a little bit about that, you know the Baghdad battery. Baghdad battery here, two thousand year old battery. Uh, battery. Uh, I, I I like to go to Wikipedia. Okay. The Baghdad battery is the name given to a set of three artifacts which were found together, a ceramic pot, a tube of copper, here's the tube of copper, right? And a rod of iron, see that? We can't see oh. your screen, Professor. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I forgot I stopped sharing the screen. Here you go, that's the bag of that battery. Okay. Uh, it has all the elements of a battery. Has all the elements of a battery, you know, a ceramic pot and two different metals. The ceramic pot is the dielectric material. Okay. And there is one, only one thing missing here in this battery, which is the liquid, which is the electrolyte. Okay. The electrolyte could be salt water, for instance. Okay. Uh, let, let's read a little bit more. Or it can be an orange juice, lemon juice, whatever, right? In a rod of iron. Just discovered in present day, Kujut Rabuk, Iraq, in 1936, close to the metropolis, to this metropolis, right? Capital of Parchin and Sassanian empires. It is believed to date from either of this period, okay? So we are talking about 150 BC, 2100, 2200 years. Its origin proposed remains unclear. It was hypothesized by Wilmer, Will, William, William Koenig at the time, director of National Museum of Iraq, that the object functioned as a galvanic cell, okay? Galvanic cell, which is nothing but a battery, possibly used for electroplating. This guy hypothesized or some kind of electrotherapy, but there is no electroplated objects known for this period. That's why they believe that this was not a battery. It was just something else that happens to use the same components of a possible battery. And the claims are nearly universally rejected by archeologists, okay? So that's very easy to manufacture a battery. You can do that at home. Okay, and then you can read about that, you know, lack of electrical connection, see that? Electroplating hypothesis, they cannot find an electroplating device. Bitumen as an insulator. Okay. And what about the electrolyte? The electrolyte could be electrolyte solution, acidic. Uh, liquid was used in acidic electrolyte solution to generate electric current. Okay. I'm showing you that, I'm showing that to you just for you to understand that uh, it's very easy to make a battery. That's why people have hypothesize that uh, device is a battery, the back of that battery is a battery, uh, okay? But again, there is no, there's some missing evidence here that really, uh, that doesn't allow you to believe for sure that, uh, oh yeah, see that they use a grape juice, huh? After Second World War, Willard Gray demonstrated the current production by a reconstruction of the inferred battery design when he filled grape juice, we fill it with grape juice. That's the electrolyte. But you can could use a, anything, almost anything as an electrolyte. Grape juice, orange juice, lemon juice, salt water. Okay. So Going back, what we're talking about, right? How can you charge them? You can charge them using a battery. You can charge the two conductors using a battery. Connect one conductor to the positive of the battery, positive terminal of the battery, terminal of the battery, and it will become, and it will, become uh, positively charged, positively 
positively charged and connect the second conductor to the negative terminal of the battery. Once you charge them, you can disconnect the battery and and it, and the you can disconnect the battery from the capacitor from the conductors and hopefully they will remain charged uh, of course assuming that you do everything this line that you see here is a dielectric okay to ensure that uh, the charges are not going to flow to the ground you cannot touch this guy if you touch this guy your hands are going to suck out that charge and the conductor will become discharged okay Okay, so the one of the most important uh, capacitors. Wh wh why capacitors are important? That's the reason why capacitors are important. Okay. Such a simple device, you know. Why capacitors are important? Important. Okay. Well, capacitors are, they are important. They are important because they store electrical energy okay which is one type of energy one thing is to have energy electrical energy now something else completely different is to ensure is to is whether you know how to use your energy which can be used to do some important type of work Okay. That's why they're important. And I'm going to emphasize how important capacitors are. Okay. In electronics, in electricity and electronics, there are four important devices. Okay. And I'm going to tell you what those four important devices are. The first of them is the capacitor. Four important basic devices. Capacitors is one of them. The other one we're going to study later is a resistor. Okay, the other one, the other important device is an inductor. This device is a magnetic type of device, okay? This is an electric type of device. This is an electric type of device. And the last one, you should have heard of this last device, is called the transistor. We are going to study these three types of device here. This device here is, is steady only more advanced forces, okay? With all those four devices, with these four devices, you can build almost anything, right? Your cell phone is made of a combination of those four devices. Capacitor is one of them. Your remote control is made of a combination of those devices. Capacitor is one of them and so on, okay? So let's emphasize here and there is more too, okay? There is more too, since many of you are in life sciences, right? Capacitors, by the way, is a very good model for some cells in the human body, okay? There are cells in the human body that works just like capacitors, electrical capacitors. In reality, the human body is an electrical type of device, okay? So much that... Uh, Electroencephalography, for instance, we, we're measuring electrical impulses. Electrical cardiogram, we use electric, we measure electrical impulses as well. In electrical encephalography and electrical cardiogram. We can measure those things. So if you remember that uh, multimeter that I showed to you, you can measure electrical potential in your body with that with that device. Let me see. Here you go. If you buy this inexpensive device, $15, the cheapest one you can get out there. You know, you can start experimenting, measuring electric 
voltage, you know, electric potential at different spots in your body, especially the head, right? Your head. Okay, but there is more that we have to talk about capacitors. It's not the only thing. Okay, let's keep on moving here. Okay, you have to memorize the fold. There is, there is a quantity related to a capacitor. It is called the capacitance, okay? Which is defined as, it's very easy to memorize that, this relation. But make sure you have that by your side. Here. Okay, here you go. Capacitance is represented by the letter C. And the capacitance of a capacitor is the electric charge divided by the electric voltage. Okay. So going back to my illustration, remember I have a, I connected here a battery to those two terminals, right? The moment I connected the battery, not only the conductor became electrically charged, the two conductors became electrically charged, but because they are charged differently, you also have an electric potential between them. The electric potential ends up being the electric potential of your battery the energy per unit charge that your battery is providing, okay? You go ahead, measure the electric charge. It's not an easy task, but it's possible, okay? Measure the electric voltage with your multimeter, divide one by the other, you get the capacitance. You get the capacitance, okay? And there is one thing interesting about uh, this, this relation here. Note C, something important about the voltage, okay? Remember what, uh, we got the voltage of the two parallel plates, remember that? The voltage between two parallel plates, okay, we derived, right? that the voltage between two par parallel plates was what? Was remember? He got right in here. That's the relationship, right? That we got for the voltage. And by the way, capacitance is always a positive number, okay? Let's, uh, so I'm gonna put, uh, you know, magnitude of Q, magnitude of delta of V. Always a positive quantity, okay? Where here X is the separation between the plates. The voltage between the two plates, let's say the separation is D at distance D, okay? And let's not forget that my sigma is what? Is Q divided by A, right? The electric charge. Here you go, here's my capacitor, my parallel plate capacitor, okay? Positive and negative. That they we, we sell those things out there. They can be small, they can be large. The cells are now in our body, they behave like parallel plate capacitors. So you can have even microscopic capacitors. Okay. So we can start finding out what is the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor. Don't forget, D is the separation between the plates. Okay, so here we go. Capacitance in this case is going to be given by 
Do you, do you notice what's happening here? Don't forget, you know, A is, A is positive, Q is gonna be positive. Uh, I'm gonna put uh, A is always positive, D is the distance always positive, epsilon naught is gonna be positive, positive too. Okay, and look what we get. One thing very important, the capacitance of any capacitor is independent of the electric charge or the voltage. Why is that? It is independent. Even though the equation relates the capacitance in terms of the, the, the charge and the voltage, even though those quantities, they disappear because the voltage will always be proportional to the electric charge. And what you end up having is that the capacitor for any, the capacitance of any capacitance will always be a function of the geometrical parameters of the device, okay? I can do that for the parallel plate. I can do that for the spherical capacitor as well. Spherical capacitor would be one shell, spherical shell inside another one, concentric shells, right? And it will always be independent of the voltage and the charge. Sounds like counterintuitive, right? How come the capacitance is defined in terms of the charge and the voltage, but it is independent of either? Well, it's independent of either because the voltage will always be proportional to the charge, okay? And the charge here is gonna cancel out with the charge there upstairs. And it happens for every capacitor. It just happens that the capacitance is gonna be having a different equation for different, uh, for different geometrical configurations, okay? That's for the parallel plate capacitor. Okay. Don't forget that this epsilon naught, right? This epsilon naught is related to that constant that you saw for the first time for pi k. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna do this like, like that. A divided by k. Oh, I don't like that. Here you go. Put it in a more familiar fashion for you. Okay. See, geometry matters for a capacitor. Geometry for a capacitor matters. And we can do the same for this spherical capacitor. Let's do the spherical capacitor. Let's see if we can do that together. A spherical capacitor, right? This spherical capacitor. Let's see if I have this illustration right here. Here you go. We have it here, an illustration. Spherical capacitor, right? Can be either negative or positive or positive or negative. And then we must also have cylindrical capacitors, okay? Before we move on, let me show you some capacitors out there. This, you know, depending on the capacitor, you can, they can be either expensive or they can be very cheap. I have bought capacitors that's only 10 cents, okay? Here are different types of capacitors. This one is cylindrical, definitely this is cylindrical. Okay, I believe this one is parallel plate. This one is parallel plate too. We have, uh, we have those in our radio. We use capacitor to tune the frequency of our favorite radio station. And that's what this device, this capacitor is used for. Okay, here's a cylindrical capacitor and so on, okay? Capacitor is a device that stores the electrical energy in an electric field by virtue of accumulating electric charge in two closed surfaces, insulated from each other. The surfaces must be insulated because you do not want to lose the energy of the capacitor. That's why if you want to store the energy in the capacitor, you must have a electrical insula you must electrically insulate those two charged surfaces, okay? If I connect this surface to this other one with a metal bar, this capacitor is going to become uncharged. The negative charges are going to combine with the positive charge. 
the capacitor is going to become uncharged, the electric field is going to disappear, and you're not going to have any energy to use it anymore. In this case, when you connect those two plates with a metal bar, you wasted electrical energy. That's what we do, okay? When you do that. Now let's uh, let's calculate the capacitance of a spherical capacitor. Let's do those are the easiest one that we can do, right? So going back here, um, notes. No, not this one. This one here, the spherical capacitor. Just like before, we start. Find the capacitance of a spherical capacitor of uh, a spherical capacitor uh, uh, consisting of two concentric spheres of radius A and B. Okay? Like that. Here you go, radius A and radius B. Let's see this radius A and B. Okay. And they have the same charge with opposite uh, opposite opposite times. Here you go. And then what we need? Well, we need to find out the electric potential between them, right? That's what we have to do. If we find the electric potential between them, you know, uh, ideally we should use a delta V here just to remind you that uh, is a potential difference, potential difference between each surface, okay? Ideally. But most books, they don't put the delta there because they want to save on the on the notation, okay? So they just put D instead of delta D, okay? For a spherical capacitor, you know, it, it behaves just like a point charge. Do you remember? When you calculate the electric field, it behaves just like a point charge. So the potential difference for each of those spheres is going to be K, Q over one is going to be A, and the other is K, Q over B, like that. It's spherical, uh, it's spherically charged, a spherically charged distribution, of, uh, a spherical geometry, right? Which behaves just like a point charge. K, Q over R. KQ over R, but just happened that one is going to be A, R, the other one's going to be B. B is greater than A, so now we end up getting a positive number here. Okay, we go ahead and cancel out the Q here with those two Qs. Okay. And we can combine. Uh, this one will be B minus K A, right? Like that. A B is going to go upstairs. Like that. That's what the capacitance is. Here you go. The next experiment that we are going to do is going to the model is very close to that of a point charge, okay? It's not as exactly a spherical capacitor, it's going to be more like a cylindrical capacitor. That's what you're going to do there in, on Wednesday. But we are not going to derive the capacitance of a cylindrical capacitor here because it's difficult to do that. The only two capacitors that we can derive here in this course are those two that we did, the parallel plate 
in this spherical one, okay? So that's what we have for capacitance. Let me take attendance. We are gonna have our break right now. Any questions? Oh, by the way, one more thing that I didn't, call, I didn't mention to you before we go for the break. Ego, the unit of capacitance is, the unit of capacitance is, okay? Once you have the formula, right, you know what the unit of a capacitance is going to be. Ego, unit of a capacitance represented by the square bracket. Like that. It's going to be ego. The unit of charge, which by the way is the Coulomb, divided by the unit, oh, electric potential, which by the way is the voltage. Ooh, gosh, don't forget that the voltage is nothing but joules, right? Per Coulomb. Oh, God, here we go, joules per Coulomb. Okay. Now, it happens that this unit shows up so frequently in physics that we give it a name. We call it farad and represent by the letter F. Okay. So let's take a look at uh, some capacitors out there. Here you go, this one here, let's see here. Oh, see this one here? It shows the value, the capacitance value of this capacitor. This capacitance is 4,700 microfarad, which is 4.7 millifarad, okay? This one here. And this one here is gonna be 100 microfarad. They imprint that in the surface of the capacitor. Uh, this one is 4.7 microfarad, right? Oh, man, I can zoom in, huh? let's see. Yeah, I can zoom in, here you go. I cannot read this one, right? But this one is 4.7 microfarad. I have seen capacitors of like one farad. Does it have it? This one is a variable capacitance, so it's not gonna have a value in there. This one, 500 volts, doesn't show what the capacitance is, right? Uh, 22 microfarad. So you have capacitors of different capacitance out there, 4.7 microfarad and so on. Okay. You can buy those things at different stores. Okay. History, okay, here's history of capacitors. They were initially called Leiden jars. You go, Leiden jars. Okay, see the parallel plate capacitor here. Here you go here, an old capacitor. We, we have one of those there, the, the college. And this capacitor has, the, you can change the distance between the plates in this capacitor. When you change the distance between the plates, you, you vary the capacitance. There is also a way to change the area of the capacitor, okay? Uh, for instance, if I have one plate oriented like that, another plate oriented like that, you have a smaller area intersecting those two devices. So this capacitor oriented in this direction has a lower, has a lower capacitance than this capacitor here, because you have a, an alignment of the area that's larger than here, okay? 
That's what this capacitor is all about. This capacitor that you see here, okay? This knob that you see here, you know, is, is there to change the relative position of the plates of the capacitor. And the capacitor, like you said, like you saw, is going to be dependent on the area and the distance between the plates. You can change the capacitor by varying the distance. You can change the capacitor by varying the overlapping area of the two plates. Okay. Now it's uh, 9.58. Let's go for our break, right? Uh, don't go yet. Let me get the roster here. Roster, good. Lecture attendance, today is the 27. The 20th of, uh, was a, oh, what happened here? Uh, huh, interesting. Okay, so, yeah, I got it this way. Okay, here was a holiday and Randy Bautista, are you there? Yeah, we're here. Thank you. Vanessa Bonilla. Let's see if Vanessa is here. I see Vanessa here, but I don't hear from her. Okay, I'm gonna put a uh, star. Ashley Diaz, are you there? I don't see Ashley here in my list. Natalie Spinoza. Uh, yes, I'm here. Thank you, Natalie. Janet Garcia. I'm here. Thank you, Janet. Noor Hassan. Vanessa Bonilla. Okay, thank you, Vanessa. Okay, what about Noor Hassan? I see her. Two. I'm here. Okay, thank you. Blanca Hernandez. Here. Okay, thank you. Blanca Kelly Hernandez. Kelly, Kelly, Kelly. I don't see Kelly. Joshua Jimenez. I don't see Joshua either. Alondra. I can't yeah, hear you. Present. present. Ah, okay, hello. Thank you. Kennedy, Lindsay. Here. Thank you. Davy Mariscal. Where is Davy? Are you there, David? Oh, yeah, I see you. Okay, thank you. Yesenia Montes Rodriguez. Thank you, Yesenia. Ryan Onk. I'm here. Thank you, Ryan. Artur Pacheco. Thank you, Labelud. I see Labelud here in my list, but I don't hear from her. Not the star here. Donia, are you there, Donia? Here. Thank you. Elika Lafe. Here. <laughs> Thank you, Brianna Valencia. Thank you, Brianna. Yustena Youssef. I see Yustena here in my list. Okay, I'm gonna put star for Yustena and we have 15, 16, 17, yeah, good. So uh, let's go for our break, 10 one right now. No break from 10 one to 10 16, okay? I see you in 15 minutes. I am back here and
and notes, notes here. Okay, keep going. 1016, right, we are back. Okay, I came up with the definition of capacitors. Okay, and uh, derived uh, the capacitance for two different geometrical configurations, the parallel plate and the spherical capacitor. Okay, and we can also, okay, in addition to that, we can also determine how much energy a given capacitor has. We can do that. We can derive that. Okay, well, the book doesn't derive that for you. I'm not going to derive that either okay? because it requires calculus integral, well, in, uh, integral calculus, right? In, integration, integration and differentiation, okay? So what the book actually do, he gives you a formula, okay? And you have to memorize that formula. But there is a mnemonic way of memorizing this formula, okay? And I'm going to give you a little rule of thumb here to, to remember this formula more easily. Okay, so let's do that together. Professor, real quick, if you didn't already know, we can't see your screen. Uh, yeah, okay, thank you. Let me, here you go. Now we have it, thank you again. We, so how do you get that? Just remember that energy is related to the electric potential, okay? Recall that delta V here is what? Delta V is nothing but delta U over charge. Remember, I'm not deriving the formula. I'm, good. I'm just giving you a mnemonic way of remembering the equation for the capacitance, okay? Remember that, right? Is delta U over Q. I should use capital Q, right? Because we are. And so consequently, this potential energy can be rewritten in terms of oh, Q delta V times Q. No, like I said, it's not, it's not a strict derivation because a strict derivation requires differentiation and integration, okay? But at least it's gonna give you a mnemonic way of remembering the equation, okay? That or what would be the energy of your capacitor. And then we can here write that. Okay, here you go. As using this formula right in here. Delta V is going to be Q divided by C, right? We replace this one right here in this equation. Okay. It's not exactly what you are supposed to get for the energy stored, but it's going to be close enough. Okay, your Q becomes squared. Okay, the actual, this is not the actual formula. This is, this is not the actual formula for the stored energy, okay? The actual formula, the actual equation, right? Is, this is not the actual formula for the stored energy, but, uh, but it is very close to it. The actual equation is, you know, Stored energy is going to be, we must have a half here. Okay. That's the actual energy, stored energy in a capacitor. Uh, you go like that. The only difference here is this half. <clears throat> okay. 
<clears throat> this half comes about whenever we do the integration of the of, of the F formula, <clears throat> which we didn't do here. Okay. This is not the actual, but it's very close to it. And there are other equations as well that we can write. Okay, so okay, moment two. Let's see. One moment. Look, background. Yeah, here you go. And compare that with the equation here. Energy, the energy in the book is right. Okay, that's the energy. Okay. Q is square over 2C. Okay. But now we can come up with other relations as well, just by using this relationship here. Okay. We can here write the stored energy in different ways. Okay. So if you want to memorize it, that's the way to do it, right? He write the potential energy in terms of V and Q, and but don't forget that this is just a mnemonic way of finding the stored energy. Okay, a more through derivation requires integration and differentiation. And once you get this relationship, all you have to remember is that it must be multiplied by half to get the actual stored energy. But there are other equations. This equation here can be written, here written a different way, okay? For instance, I can replace C by Q divided by delta V, okay? When we do that, what do we get? Just another way. Go. I'm going to stop uh, writing down this magnitude, okay? So I don't keep on carrying all those signs there. That's another relation. Q times delta V. Half. The Q square cancels out the Q downstairs. That's one way. Okay. And there is one more way. The other way is you're writing uh, the Q in terms. Of C and Delta V. And replace in there. Right. And now you choose which one you want to, to use. And then you have this option, right? I'm going to summarize the three different formats, two, three possible formats of this formula. Okay. And here you go. Now we have three different formats of the same formula that gives you the same result. They just look different, but they are, okay? They are, they give you exactly the same result. The first one is this one that's easy to derive in terms of the, of the definition of uh, delta V, right? In delta U. Delta U is potential energy, which you know is the is, uh, is the stored energy, with the only difference that there's a half missing here. If you derive something like that and remember there's a missing half, you can memorize this formula easier, easily. The other format is this one here. Uh, 
Oh, what, what, what did I do here? Let's see here. Uh, yeah, okay, this one. Let's do it again, this one here. Yeah. The other one is this one here. Okay, half of Q delta V. And the last one is this one here. When I look at this formula, this last formula, I think it's the easiest one to memorize. I think this one is the easiest one to memorize. What does it look like, you know? Think about that, what it looks like. It's half of something times V squared, right? Remember that formula? We have a similar formula in mechanics, right? So that's another little trick that we can use to memorize this equation, in case you don't remember, just remember of the kinetic energy in, in mechanics, which has almost the same format for the stored energy of a capacitor. The M is replaced by the capacitor. The velocity is replaced by the electric potential, delta V squared, right? So, that what we have for that, for the capacitor. There are lots of applications of capacitors. Oh, uh, okay, here you go. One of them is the defibrillator, the defibrillator. The defibrillator has an energy that can be used to restart someone else's heart. Okay. Uh, flash cameras, they also use a capacitor to, for, to power that bright light that emitted, okay? The energy storing capability of a capacitor is often put to good use in electronic circuits. For example, an electronic flash attachment for a camera, energy from the battery pack is stored in a capacitor, okay? So the battery is a device that can provide energy for a very long amount of time, okay? You get your battery and the battery is providing energy to your device for a very long amount of time. Capacitors are different. Capacitor is a type of very simple battery that can provide energy in a very small amount of time, okay? Exactly what this guy is saying here. Flash duration times range from one to hundreds to one, a thousand, one million seconds. Okay, so all the way up to a one microsecond. So think about that you have an energy being discharged in this amount of time, anywhere between one to hundreds of a second to one microsecond. That's why it produces capable of producing such a bright light. Okay, that do, that's another application of capacitor. Capacitors behave slightly different from battery, but the goal of both devices is to provide with energy, with electrical energy. Defibrillator, defibrillator is the same situation, right? You provide a, a huge boost of energy in a small amount of time to restart your heart. Okay. And remember that I told you about the, the cells, the human body is nothing but uh, an electrically powered device. Here is a model of a cell. Here is a cell membrane, okay, which is nothing but a dielectric material. This cell membrane is usually found in solutions in which you have a difference of charge across the membrane. Here, inside the cell, we call so-called intracellular fluid, which by the way is an electrode, is an electrolyte. You have a negatively charged fluid, more negative charges than positive. And on the outside, we have a positively charged fluid more positive charges than negative charges. 
So the cell membrane actually behaves like a capacitor. You have negative charge here, positive charge here. The membrane ensures that we have this separation of electric charges and this whole set carries a an electrical energy that's given by that formula that you saw. Okay. Once you know that, you can picture the rest, right? The remaining. Here is uh, the sodium going through the membrane, sodium channels, right? We call it sodium channels. Okay. And those are the applications of capacity. Here is the, the neuron, typical. And the, the neuron is nothing but an, but an electrical device, OK? I remember when I was working there at NASA, I was watching a presentation by a scientist. And he had his own neurons that he put in a little Petri dish and connected the neurons to electrical terminals in his experiment. He did that, which was really strange. You know, think about that. Uh, it's like uh, uh, organic technology, right? That's what we call organic technology. I saw that back in the 90s, in the 1990s. Maybe technology has advanced much more since then. It's not my area of expertise, but uh, that's what he was showing to us. You know, he, he was cultivating his neurons in a Petri dish, and he noticed that the neurons itself was uh, could make connections with the electrodes that he put there in the in his his Petri dish. And think about uh, that, that that's what we have all over the body, right? It's an amazing cell, those neurons. The nucleus is, is in the head, but then you have all those axons that distribute throughout the whole body that uh, connects to the, to the nervous system, right? The nerve endings. This guy is connected to the nerve endings. So the nerve endings are just like uh, sensors in, distributed throughout the body. They are temperature sensor, they are pressure sensor, and only the nerve ending does the sensing. Only the nerve ending does the sensing. Okay, that's why we end up having such a huge network of nerves in our body. Now imagine is instead, right? That, that's how nature designed our human body, right? Nature designed our human body in such a way that, that only the nerve endings does the sensing. No, the only the nerve endings uh, sense temperature, sense uh, pressure and other parameters, right? And on, on a, on, in addition to that, he also does some actuation, right? It's not just sensing, but actuation as well. It's a, it's a device that, that does two things. Now think about that. Imagine if instead of having the sensing portion of neurons only, instead of having that only at the tip, but somehow, we would be able to design neurons that could do the sensing all along the fiber, all along the axon, okay? How much material we could save, right, in the human body? Think about that. That's the, I, I'm, I'm talking about that because that's, that's my area of expertise, okay? I have an optical fiber sensor that can do sensing all along the lanes, not just at the tip of the fiber. Okay. So some food for thought for you all. And that's what we have for this chapter. Let's see, there is one more thing that I, I skipped. I want to do it with you. Uh, let's see, let's potential difference capacitors and potential surface, potential energy. Yeah, there is one important exercise that I want to do here with you in, the, in this book that I skipped initially. It's, uh, it's an example. It's related to electric potential energy. And so we finish that and you can start on the next chapter. Uh, it's... Uh, nice.
Oh, this one here. The potential energy of a group of charges. We, we, we should be doing this one, okay? We should be doing it's a very important example. Suppose I have uh, three charges, okay? Uh, spaced by like that, you know? Think about that. This charge here is attracting this one. This charge here is also attracting this one. And those two charges, they're repelling one another. Suppose that we can keep all those three charges together, okay? In order to keep all those three charges together without one flying away from the other or the other, you know, getting closer and closer to the other, it requires energy to do that. Think about that. And we can calculate the energy of the system in a, in a rather simple way, okay? We can calculate the energy of those point charges. Remember, we're, doing, we're calculating the energy of point charges here. There is a way to do that. Okay, potential energy of a group of charges. Three point charges initially and infinitely apart. Then as figure 19.1 shows, they are brought together and placed at the corners of the equilateral triangle. Each side of triangle has length half meter. Determine the electric potential energy of the triangular group. In other words, determine the amount by which the electric potential energy of the group differs from that of the three charges in their initial infinitely separated locations, okay? So we start, you know, with, uh, with our first charge, charge number one. They are completely separated from each other, okay? Infinitely separated from each other. At this very moment, the net energy of those three particles is zero. The net potential energy of those three particles is zero because they are very far away from each other. Their forces is zero, okay? And then we're gonna start bringing them together one by one. We start with charge one that, that is positioned, okay? We do know, okay, uh, let, let me write that down here in my notes. Example uh, eight, example eight, chapter 19 in the book, chapter 19, chapter 19 in the book, determine the electric potential, the electric potential energy of an arrangement of three electric charges, okay? Q1, Q2, and Q3. The process to do that's not obvious. That's why I'm doing that for you. Remember that we did that for the capacitor, parallel plate capacitor, okay? Solution, right? Well, it's slightly different from the book, so you can understand better. The three charges are infinitely apart, are initially, Neatly. For this reason, their force is zero and their net potential energy. And I'm talking about the potential energy among those three charges is also zero. Okay. In the next step, we approach, let's say we approach the second charge. We bring uh, the second charge closer to the first one. The second charge is negative, right? The second charge tends to come closer to the first one because it has a negative charge. And we keep it 
we keep uh, these two charges at distance d, right? The distance d is half meter. Okay. In order to do that, we must have some sort of energy to ensure the second charge does not combine with the first one, right? Think about that, one positive and another negative charge. That tendency is to approach each other, okay? And collide, okay? But, but if somehow we manage to keep them at, at a given position, at the at a distance, that's because there must be some sort of energy holding them there. I'm not saying how we did it. I'm just telling you the two charges are at a given distance and tell me what is the electric potential energy of this system right now, okay? How do we do that? Okay. Okay, so it's going to be the electric potential energy between one and uh, charge one and charge two. Okay. That's what we're going to have. Uh, Q1 should be V2 plus V3. Okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, we're talking about. Oh, I, I mixed that, right? Q2 is a positive charge. Okay, let me see. Yeah, in the next step, we'll bring the second charge. Oh, these two charges, in order to do that, we must have some sort of energy to ensure that the second charge moves. Okay, I, I'm, I was mixing up Q2 with Q3. Okay, the second charge moves the, towards the first one. Okay, the second charge is going to resist the motion of going towards the first one because they both have the same sign. Okay, here you go, yeah. Okay, so the electric potential energy of the system is going to be what? The charge Q, let me write the book called the uh, electric potential energy. In general, we denote it by the letter U, okay? Uh, I'm going to say the electric potential energy between charges one and two, like that, which is going to be charge of one, actually, charge of two, right? times electric potential due to one, which is Q, oops, Q2 times Q1, KQ1 divided by the distance between one and two. Okay, it's gonna be like that. The distance between one and two is going to be D. That's the energy between charge one and two. Next, we will bring the third charge closer to the other two in such a way that all the three charges will form a Equilateral, equilateral triangle. Okay, so here you go. Not only we are going to have uh, an electric potential energy between charges one and three. Okay, let's put here one and two. Here's one and three.
Okay. Which is going to be given by that. But we are also going to end up having an electrical potential energy between electric charges two and three. Oops. Two and three. And I'll put that two. I'll put that two. Okay, here should be one, three, right? Which ends up being the same. Did I change everything? Yes, I did. Uh, let's see. I put charge three here. V2, yeah. Three. Okay, two, three. So that's the trick. You know, the net electric potential energy of the system will be the summation of the three EPs above. Or, here we go. EP is equal to EPE one, two plus EPE one, three plus EPE two, three. Uh, we have one, two plus one, three plus two, three. Okay, and let's see, I'll keep this one. Q2, Q1. Q2, Q1. Like that. Net EP. Okay, uh, what, what can we do here to make it look easier? We can factor the K, we can factor D as well, right? So we eliminate K from here, we eliminate, we have only Q1, Q1, Q2, Q1, Q3, Q3, Q2. And I'm going to put the K over D in evidence. Okay, that's what we end up having for this, for the solution of this problem. Okay, we can do the numerical values as well. Okay. So for N, uh, for N charges, and charge and point charge distribution, point charge and point charges, the net potential energy will be, here you go. Uh, two plus one, three plus one N. Right, one N plus EPE two three. We you know we already have we, we cannot we cannot uh, do the two one because we already did that for here. Okay, the energy between one and two cannot be repeated here. Two one is equal to one two, and here you go. EPE uh, two four. One, two, three, plus EPE, two N, right? And then we have, you know, we have those summations, okay? Until, let's see, EPE, EPE, and uh, put N, uh, N minus one, I'm gonna put the, oh, uh oh. And uh, minus one and 
and minus one comma n, it's like that, the summation. Very important to have that. I'm going to put that as a summation right now. The first one is, here you go, APE one N. Uh, no, sorry, I'm going to put J here. J. J going from two to N, right? Shorthand notation. Then we are going to have the charge two, three to N, right? Until my last one. Um, and I'm going to do that. Uh, J, let's see here. J from N to N, let's do this way. Like that. It's just one term for this one. So that's the one I want to do with you that I hadn't done before. Okay. And uh, one more thing, right? One more thing about capacitors. One more thing about capacitors. Okay. What we do, what we did up to now, up to now was to get the capacitance of a device, of a capacitor, okay? Going back, here you go, going back to capacitors, right? Going back to capacitors. Let's see, what, what we did up to now was to get the capacitance of a capacitor having Nothing between their plates. Having, let's see, the perfect dielectric, not nothing, but having the perfect dielectric between its plates. Its plates, okay? The perfect dielectric is nothing but vacuum. The perfect dielectric being the vacuum okay what if we have a different type of dielectric between the plates okay for instance for instance glass or plastic or wood or even air, water too. Water is a dielectric, pure, pure water is a dielectric, pure water or even air. Air is also considered uh, a dielectric. For this situation, Comma. We must adjust our formula, adjust our formulas, and I'm going to explain why. Okay, here you go. Uh, let's see if I have a bit. one here for you. Oh, I don't have it. What a shame. Let's see. Uh, I have it somewhere. Must be in another. Oh, here you go. I got it. Okay. Vacuum between the plates of a capacitor. Here you go. Now, what uh, if you have a vacuum between the plates of the capacitors? All that those formulas that I gave to you is good. They're good. However, if I put something else, 
can be a piece of cardboard, can be a piece of glass, can be a piece of plastic. Remember, we must put a dielectric there because if we put a conducting material here in between, all, this, all those plates are going to become discharged and you're going to waste electrical energy, okay? In a practical sense, that's what it's all about. That's why we put a dielectric between those two plates, okay? So if we have that, those dielectrics between those two plates, we have a very nice model to explain what happens to this system, okay? So these dielectric material are made of positive and negative charges. And because we have an electric field between the positive and negative plates, the material inside the dielectric is going to become what we call polarized. And what do we mean by polar, polar, polarized? I mean that uh, the negative charges are going to become slightly separated from the positive charge, okay? Outside the electric field, we do not have the situation. We have an actual sphere, right, in which the negative charge is very close to the positive charge. The charges are not polarized. But in this situation, we do. When we have a, the very, and then what else? What else? Is a, a story that has a, something else there. Okay. Those polarized substances in the dielectric, because we polarize the substance, you know, because we came up with a separation of electric charges in those substances, there will also be an electric, internal electric field here within, this, uh, within those polarized molecules, which by the way, is gonna counter the main external electric field. Can you picture that? Okay. So now, the net electric field is going to be less intense. Do you see that? Here we had lots of lines, right? Closer, which means an intense electric field. And now because of the, the polarization of the molecules, this red electric field is going to be, become weaker. The density of electric fields are going to become smaller, okay? So if we have uh, this much electric field when the plates are separated by vacuum, we're going to have a weaker electric field when we put a dielectric material inside the plates. Okay, so here you go, side by side, stronger field, weaker field. Let me go, I got to get this thing here. Mm -hmm. Uh, right here. Do I have the same problem there? No, I don't. And now that we have a weaker electric field, okay, we can come up and say, there you go, I'm gonna write everything that I told you. It's just like a story, a good story, explaining what happens to the electric field inside a, a, a capacitor with a dielectric, right? When uh, we insert a dielectric material between the plates of our capacitor, comma, the electric field becomes weaker, okay? So it's gonna be something like that. E, you stand for electric field, but is the electric field who is the dielectric? Let's make sure that I'm using the same, uh, the same uh, notation of the book, okay? Um, yeah, that's, that's going to be the same notation of the book, okay? E is the new electric field. E not is the electric field of the perfect dielectric. 
Okay. Where divided, it's going to be divided by a term that we call kappa. Okay. And this term here, kappa, is going to be greater than one. Okay. Here you go. Being the ratio of the field strengths. The dilatic constant is a number without units. This is called, just call it uh, the dilatic constant. Yeah, dilatic constant. Kappa is called the dilatic constant. This is called the dilatic constant. And its value depends on the dialectic material. And its value depends on the dielectric material. I don't see, let's see if we have a table here. Uh, yeah, we do have a table here. See that the dielectric constant of vacuum is one. The dielectric constant of air is very close to one, okay? Teflon, which is that little, which is that material that's coated in your pants, to prevent any of the food to stick to it, is 2.1, has a dielectric constant 2.1, benzene 2.8, water has a very high dielectric constant. Okay, paper, paper is a dielectric material. We have mica, mica that uh, is, I do not know if you have ever seen, but when I was growing up, you know, a little kid, I used to collect rocks, and many of my rocks had this little planar substance, you know, stuck to the rock surface that was transparent to, there's a mica, that was mica, okay? So if you, if you put the dielectric material there between the plates, things are gonna change, okay? And all those formulas that we saw before must be revised, must be revised, okay? One thing that we discover is that the electric field becomes weaker. That's what we discover. Okay. And uh, let's get that. 18. No, it's here. Capacitors and dielectric. One thing that we discover is that the electric field becomes weaker because of the dielectric material. Here you go, the same explanation that I gave in my slides, right? Here you go, we have a polarization of the dielectric. The, the, this polarization interferes with the external field. Okay. Here's the electric field with the dielectric. Here's the electric field with the ideal, with the ideal dielectric medium, which is vacuum. Okay. By, let's not forget. Okay, so if we have this relationship here, remember, that we also, we are also going to have the following relationship for the electric uh, potential and the distance between the plates, right? Not just for the case of vacuum, not just for the case of the ideal dielectric material, but for the case of the, of any dielectric material. Okay, any dielectric material. I'm going to here write this E in terms of this relationship that I see I have here. Okay. And let's see what get what, what that gets us. E naught is also V naught divided by D. Okay. And now I can, here you go, I can, one divided by D, oh, here you go, like that. Mm 
what does this formula tell us? This formula tells us that my V is also, my electric potential also decreases by a factor kappa. This V here, I'm gonna even rewrite it in a different way so you can see it more clearly. Okay, one divided by the, oh gosh, it always does that to me. Okay, see, my V now can be correlated with this V naught divided by kappa. Just by using this relationship here and the relation between the electric field and the electric potential, we also, we find, right? That V is going to be V naught divided by kappa. Not only the electric field decrease, not only the electric field decreases, but the electric potential also does. Okay, what else can we do? There's a little bit more things here that we can do. Um, okay. So recall that, uh, let's go back to the capacitance, right? The capacitance, which I'm going to rewrite in a different way now. Here you go. The equation for the capacitance, now I'm gonna rewrite like that. And I'm gonna take out this delta here just to simplify my relation. Here is the capacitance of the capacitance, or well, the capacitor with vacuum between the plates. This Q doesn't change, okay? The, the capacitor doesn't lose its play, its charge whenever you have uh, a dielectric there in between, right? Now we put a dielectric, the Q doesn't change, but the V changes and consequently the capacitance change as well. And then what happens? V is V naught divided by kappa, right? And look what we get. Kappa gets multiplied by the Q V naught. And what this guy right here is this one here, right? The initial capacitance. The capacitance without any dielectric whatsoever. Okay, remember this one is a number greater than one has no units whatsoever. It's a unitless value. So let's, let's summarize what we have so far. Here you go. The electric field decreases. The electric potential decreases. When we insert but the capacitance, no, the capacitance increases when we insert that dielectric material, okay? What about the energy, right? Here you go, the stored energy. What about the stored energy? I, I have to rewrite my equations, right? In a different way, here you go. The stored energy, I'm going to take out this store and just uh, label it a U naught for, you know, energy, stored energy for the case of a capacitor that has vacuum between each plate, right? C naught, V naught square, right? Then what about, uh, you know, the equation should hold as well for a dielectric in between, okay? It's still gonna be V squared, half of CV squared. It's still gonna be the same formula, but with different values. Let's see how different it becomes. 
Okay? This equation is going to tell us the story. Here you go. My C becomes kappa C naught. My V becomes V naught over kappa divided squared uh, over kappa squared. Let's see if I can get. Oh, no, cannot do that. I'm going to get this one here. Yep. And then what happens? What do you see is going to happen to the energy? I'm going to square this term here. Oh, nope, not this one. Wrong one. Here you go. Kappa is, is going to become squared. Kappa squared is going to cancel out this kappa. And look what we get. Let's see. Uh, I'm going to. I'm going to put my kappa here in front of everybody. Now I do not need the kappa anymore. Look what we get. My new energy is going to decrease as well because half C naught V naught square is U naught, right? So here. The energy also decreases. So if you want to have a capacitor that has the most amount of energy, you might want to build a capacitor that has vacuum there between the plates. But that if you want to optimize, right? The amount of maximize the amount of energy that it can hold. Okay, so here you go. That's what we have, parallel plate capacitor filled with a dielectric. Okay, here you go. That's the formula, right? Remember, for a parallel plate capacitor filled with a dielectric, C0 is going to be what? It's going to be um, epsilon naught. Epsilon naught. What else? A over D, right? Is that what we have there in the book? Let's take a look. Kappa, epsilon naught, A over D. Yes, that's what it is. It's not, uh, we're not even memorizing here, we're deriving, right? Here's an example of how capacitors are used in real life. Okay. Um, is an example of a keyboard. Keyboards, the ones that I, we use, they have capacitors there inside. Okay, when we depress one of the keys, what happens? You know, the distance between the parallel plates momentarily change. And that's how the computer uh, discovered, you know, knows which key is, is being depressed. Okay, energy storage in a capacitor. Let's see here, energy. Okay, we have more, a little bit more here. <laughs> energy density. Let's see if we can do the energy density here. Uh, it's 11.15, right? Okay, let's, uh, and I'll let you look into that. This one is not difficult to, to derive. Okay, let's see here. Half CV squared, yeah. So what's what that gonna be, you know? Ka, kappa, eh, he meant kappa here. He meant kappa here, not K, but kappa, okay? Epsilon not A divided by D is the capacitance of the parallel plate capacitor. V is ED, okay? And then what do we do? The area, you know, this D square cancel out with this D and we end up with A times D. A times D is the volume of the capacitor, okay? And uh, if we put the volume of the capacitor to the other side, we get the energy density, energy divided by the volume, which is half of kappa epsilon naught e squared. I'm gonna do that for you quickly, okay? And then you can go in our, in our break. And after the break, we're going to do the, the quiz. Only three questions, okay? We have seen that everything that we, we have here in, the, in this quiz, you, you have seen before. Now, let's see. Um, here is the 
I start with this one here, right? And there's another way of you writing down this energy, not in terms of energy, but in terms of energy density. Is a neat way of memorizing that. What this C is, this C is going to be kappa. Kappa, uh, epsilon naught, epsilon naught, um, A over V, parallel plate. Okay, parallel plate. For a parallel plate capacitor. And my V can be here written as the electric field times the distance between the plates. Okay, and now I'm going to, you know, I'm doing exactly what the book did there, but with more detail. I am, um, I have to distribute the square between those terms between parentheses. The d square cancel out with the d. Consequently, we have something like that. Okay, and look what we end up getting here. Now I'm gonna go another step. So I do all the steps here for you. Okay, this a times d is the area of the capacitor times the distance, which is nothing but the volume of the capacitor. Okay. V for volume, let me see, I'm gonna put like a lowercase v. Let's see how the book did it. No, the book didn't put lowercase v, okay. Uh, I'm gonna write down volume, volume, okay? Volume of the capacitor. And now I'm gonna do one more step here. U divided by volume, okay, is the energy density. the energy density, and we give it, a, I'm gonna give it a name. I'm gonna call it lowercase u, okay? And look what we get. We get epsilon naught uh, e squared divided by two, right? With that uh, dielectric constant factor. By the way, by the way, even though we derived, we derived the energy density for a parallel plate capacitor, comma. This formula is also good for the for any capacitor geometry. Okay, remember that for any. We're not going to derive that. We don't derive that because it's too much work. Okay, and now it's eleven twenty. Uh, I want to confirm with you that you can see the the quiz there. The quiz is going to become available at 11.35, right? Let's go for our break. Can do you see the, the quiz there in the in the in canvas? Can you please confirm that with me, please? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, good. So it's going to become available at 11.35. Is that right? Uh, that's what it says. Okay, good. Just want to confirm that. Yeah, 11.35. So let's have our break and uh, when you come back from the break, you can start the quiz. I'll be here. All right, thank you. Talk with you, okay? I see you in 15 minutes.